Okay, let's uh, get started. We will return in a few minutes to our theme on collective uh, robotics, but before we do, let's talk a little bit about uh, the final project. Um, I have graded almost everyone's weekly report number one. I've gone through most of your projects, and I think the vast majority of them seem reasonable, not overly ambitious, not overly simplistic. Uh, a few of you, I gave a few pointers about things to think about as you're implementing your final projects. So now we get to the fun part, which is you have to actually implement things. So as promised at the beginning of this class, at the beginning of every lecture between now and the end of the semester, I'll go over a few tips and tricks, things that might be useful to you uh, in your final project. First one I want to talk about uh, is wheels. So a lot of you have proposed a project to do something um, above and beyond legged locomotion. Um, as you know, legged locomotion is already challenging. Getting something to walk towards an object and pick it up and throw it towards a second object uh, can be challenging. So one way to simplify your project is to remove the legs and add wheels. So let's talk about wheels for a little bit. Let's take our good friend, uh, the quadruped, and if we are considering a side view of the quadruped, first thing to do is go back in and remove all of the objects and joints uh, associated with um, quadruped. And while I'm on the subject, so if you're changing the morphology of the robot, you can always comment things out. So remember, during the assignments, we were gradually adding one object, <laughs> one joint, one sensor, one synapse. Uh, at a time, go back and comment things out. You should be able to take your quadruped and comment out part of your code so that it just falls apart into nine pieces. So there's nothing there except the nine objects, and you, or the eight, <coughs> nine objects, right? Yeah, nine objects. Nothing there but the nine objects, comment out all the joints, all the sensors, all the neurons, and all the synapses, right? Okay, so you might comment everything out all the way back to just the initial object and then add four wheels. And remember, we're looking at this from the side view, so we're looking at the front right wheel and the back uh, right wheel. We've got our objects there. Attach the wheels back to the main body with a hinge joint. Add back in your sensors and motors. You need to make one final change to this uh, robot here, which is to switch the hinge joint from position control to velocity control. What does that mean? Remember that uh, when we were talking about motor neurons, motor neuron outputs a value where a negative value represents uh, flexion rotating in towards the body and a positive number is extension. Right? So the actual number is representing a desired angle or a desired position, if you like, of the two objects relative to one another. You'll notice if you go into the uh, documentation and you click at the bottom here on simulator documentation, scroll all the way down to all of the, um, uh, the description for send hinge joint, you'll see that there's an argument there at the end called position control. And the default for this uh, flag is true. So um, by default, all of the joints that you create are positioned controlled. The number that arrives at that hinge joint from a motor neuron is indicating a desired angle. If you set that flag to false, the value arriving at that hinge joint is going to be treated as a desired, uh, as a desired velocity. So uh, that's velocity control. So if you set position control equal to false here, and for example, you send a value of uh, 10, that means that this uh, joint is going to try and rotate at 10 radians per second. So you're outputting a desired velocity. A value arriving here of minus 10 would be that this joint is going to spin backwards or rotate backwards at minus 10 radians per second. Value of zero is zero velocity. Make sense? Okay, so we now have a robot that's made up of five objects and four joints. The four joints are velocity controlled rather than position controlled. How might this uh, wheeled robot turn? Varying speeds. 
Exactly, which sometimes works. It depends on how you build the robot. So another way to do this, if you want the wheels themselves to turn, is to add an axle. And the way to do that is to create a second smaller sphere that is sitting inside the wheel itself. Connect the chassis to the axle with a hinge joint, which is position controlled and the joint normal points up in the vertical direction. And then connect the axle to the wheel with a forward or backward turning uh, velocity control joint. So why would we connect the chassis to the axle with a hinge joint that rotates about the vertical axis? What is that gonna cause the wheel to do? You know the wheels on your shopping cart, right? So it's like it basically turns into a caster wheel. So it'll rotate back and forth, and a motor neuron assigned to the axle will turn the wheel, and a second motor neuron, which is attached to the joint that connects the axle to the wheel, will spin the wheel forward and backwards, right? So now you can have wheels that turn and also spin forward and back. Last detail about wheels. How would you get the wheels, like the wheels on your car, to turn with the same angle and spin with the same speed? So for each wheel, we now have two, we now have two joints, and so for the two front wheels, for example, there's a total of four joints. How are we going to get pairs of joints to do the same thing? Just give them the same weights. Give them the same weights, right? So remember that we have, for example, um, we have one motor that's controlling the axle on the left and another motor neuron that's controlling the axle on the right. We're, at the moment, we're evolving synaptic weights, but you don't necessarily have to evolve all the synaptic weights. You can set some of the weights yourself. I was going to ask, why don't we just connect both of the wheels to the same sort of uh, what is it, motor neuron so that they'll both yep. receive the same we, because we didn't set that up in PyroSim, oh. so we're going to have to hack this a little bit. There is no way to do that. Every joint has zero or one motor neuron associated with it. Right. So we might have, for example, uh, a weight here that controls the rotation of the axle on the left, and that might be an evolved parameter. But we don't evolve the second one, we just copy it over here. Right. Okay, so that will make sure that these two uh, motors or these two joints are always doing the same thing, but what they do is still being controlled by evolution, which is setting this particular synaptic wave. This might be a stupid question. But no such thing as a stupid question. Um, which object should we use to make the wheel like, flat on both sides? Ah. There is, again, no good way to do that. At the moment, we only have these capped cylinders, so you're going to have to have spherical wheels for, uh, for this semester. Well, haven't got there yet. You can set the cylinder if you tap the response. Oh, you can. All right, I spoke too soon then. <laughs> Send cylinder. Well spotted. OK, I take that back. There you go. That's how. <clears throat> My developers are running ahead of, of me here. Um, also, there's a time or low value that you have to set. Yep. Um, and I've been having trouble, like, it kind of like hiccups, like, once it gets to a certain point. Yeah, that, that's another good point. So, uh, this is true of most physics engines. They have a hard time dealing with uh, hard limits. So, when something is rotated and hits an actual limit, it, there's a, like when an object hits the ground, how does it deal with that? Well, when, an, when it, a uh, hinge joint hits its limit, there is an opposing force that pushes in the opposite direction, right? And if it's rotating at a very rapid velocity and hits up against that hard limit, there's a sudden jerk as there's a sudden new force that's pushing back in the opposite direction. So you get hiccuping, right? Which in some cases evolution will start to exploit because there's a sudden increase in force at that point in time. The easiest way to deal with that is to uh, increase the high stop and decrease the low stop, but make sure that your motor neurons are still outputting a desired value between what you want as the high and the low stop. So you don't actually need mechanical high and low stops. Did you guys get this on this side? I'm passing around again. 
Um, you don't need to actually set mechanical limits here. You can have a freewheeling joint, but if there's a motor neuron associated with it, it's going to more or less keep the joint within the desired range of motion. Yeah? Okay. So I sort of walked you through the basics of how to go from uh, legs to wheels. Those of you that are just joining us, um, some of you have submitted a sort of an overly ambitious project. So try and get the additional functionality with wheels first. And then if you have time, you can put the legs back on. Unless leg and locomotion is an intrinsic part of your project. If you scroll down, there's a high and low optional. I thought I saw that on there. They say optional. Can you just leave those uh, Optional means they're optional for you to set them. If you don't set them, okay. they're at their default, which is yes. this. Okay. okay. So it, most of the most of the uh, arguments in Pyrosum are hidden from you, and they're set the default. So now you can sort of go through the documentation and find out what else is in there, which might be useful for your project. So actually speaking, that good thing to do is just to scroll through the documentation here. It's not it's not too long. Okay. So that's the first thing. There are two other. Yep. Is there a way to change the default size of the window that pops up when you're seeing like your final robot? Uh, that's a good question. Um, it's on our list of to-dos. I'm not sure if it's in here yet. Because when it pops up, it's kind of like a quarter of my screen. And uh, if I wanted to get a better quality video recording. Yes, that's a good question. It wasn't able to find anything. It you can move the camera back. Yeah, exactly. So you, you, you can't change the default size of the window. <laughs> that's something we're, we're working on. You can, however, as mentioned, set where the camera is. So you'll notice there's XYZ here and HPR. XYZ, as you can imagine, is the position of the virtual camera in the simulation. And HPR is heading, pan, and roll. So that is actually the direction in which the camera is pointing, right? So you can set the position of the camera and its orientation. And even with a smaller window, you might be able to get a better visualization of your, your robot. You can also start if click paused, expand the window, start your screen recording, yeah. and play the pitches. That makes sense too, yeah. No points will be taken off for cinematic, uh, lack of cinematic quality <laughs> here. Just as long as we can see what you're trying to show us, that's all that matters. Okay, so that's wheels. Next thing I want to cover, uh, which might be useful to quite a few of you, is setting a good fitness function. So if you remember back to our uh, lecture on bipedal locomotion and silly walks, they had a relatively sophisticated fitness function, which had a large number of terms, which were selecting for things and punishing for other things. So some of the behaviors that um, you're all going after in your final project is going to have to require careful creation of a fitness function. So I wanted to take about 10 minutes and sort of walk through how this works and where some of the common pitfalls are. So let's go back to our, uh, our good friend, the quadruped, for a moment. And let's imagine instead of locomotion, you want to select for jumping. Jumping obviously has to do with the position of the robot. So let's add a position sensor in each object. And again, I'm only doing this in three dimensions, or in two dimensions. So in two dimensions, our quadruped has five objects and five position sensors. So the fitness function that's going to select for jumping is going to be some function of the data returned by these five position sensors. What is that fitness function? Why is it, isn't, isn't it just the maximum um, Z value of P3? Okay, the maximum, the maximum value of P3. Yeah, Thank you for saying that because you can try it and you will see one of the most obvious examples of perverse instantiation, mm -hmm. which you probably figured out by now, which is? Uh, that'll just maybe raise itself up as high as Absolutely, possible. right? There is a huge local optima, yeah. which is to stand on your tippy toes, right? Mm -hmm. There is clearly another mountain out there, which is higher than that local optima, which is actual jumping, right? P3 can get higher than standing on your tippy toes if it jumps, but creating a fitness function that says maximize P3 is not going to get you jumping. So again, for a lot of the behaviors you're after, that's fine. You might stick in uh, a naive uh, fitness function, run it, 
see the perverse instantiation, and it will suggest the next iteration of the fitness function, which is? Would you minimize the distance between P1 and P2 or P5 and P4? Or maybe? Sorry, say that again. Minimize the distance between? The, each, the, the parts of the legs. Or maybe P2 and P4 on the ground, and then maximize P3, the height. Maybe. Other ideas? Um, so you take P3 minus the length of the two parts, P1 and P2. P3 minus? Length, the two lengths of the two legs. Oh, you want to minimize the distance between these. So actually, let's, let's just clarify this a little bit. We're after, what's the vertical direction in pyrosynth? Y or Y. I think it, I never remember. You switch back and forth. It's Z. Let's go with Z today. Okay. So obviously we don't need X and we don't need Y. So let's sharpen our discussion here. We're going to focus just on Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, and Z5. Remember when you use a position sensor um, and you get sensor data from a position sensor, it's going to give you back a matrix, which is T columns wide, right, where every column corresponds to one time step in the simulator, and three... Uh, rows deep, which is X, Y, and Z. And then you can pull pieces out of that matrix, right? So we're pulling out for the moment. Let's so imagine we pulled out Z. The only thing we're interested in is height. So one thing we could try and do is minimize the distance between Z1 and Z3 or Z2 and Z3. Well, I was thinking that it wouldn't have a fitness function that's greater than zero if, until it like, gets off the ground. So how are we going to know that it's off the ground? Well, if C3... It's tricky, right? Want to get another shot at it? Yeah, it's the okay. maximum of the sum of all the Z values. Uh, okay, let's try that. So maximum, maximum of all the Z values. So I'm going to... Let's create another vector. I'm going to call this Z, and this vector is going to... I'm just going to stack... Z1, Z2, all the way through Z5. Okay, so now we have a 5 by T matrix. So we just take the maximum value in there. No, no, the sum uh, uh, sorry, uh, that throughout the simulation. Uh, yeah, so throughout the simulation, the, the fitness value would be established by the maximum of the sum of all the Z values. So if it props all of its limbs off the ground. Okay, so let's try that. So we can take the sum of Z which will, if you take, if you use NumPy's, uh, uh, if you use NumPy's um, functions here, it'll squash along this dimension first, right? So we'll now get back a one by t vector, which is the sum of all five z's, and then we take the max of that. Getting closer. How's that going to do? Can we do better than that? So we're summing, right? We're trying to get all five objects as high as possible. But we're going to just take the max. So the robot could, in, in theory, crouch, in which case the sum of the z values at that point in time is pretty low. But if it then jumps, we draw this over time, it might actually dip and then jump. And if we're taking the maximum, it would grab that sum. So that sounds promising. Well, what someone just was saying was like, okay, what I understood was, if we took the maximum of the Z3 value yep. minus the length of Z1, the Z1 object plus the Z2 object length, okay. then it has to be above the ground. Or above, the, so the, the Z3 has to be higher than the Z1. Displays and Z2. And, and higher than Z2, but doesn't that still mean that it's going to stand? But if you try to maximize that, yep. and then it, it has, if Z3 is greater, if that value is greater than zero, okay. then it means the, the robot's off the ground. Okay, that's a possibility as well. So there's lots of things here that work pretty well. Can we subtract it by the initial Z value, or the initial Z sum? We could do that. So, right, so we know the sum here, This is, we know it at t equals zero, it's not jumping. So we could say take this and subtract exactly t, what it is at t0. And any positive, if it's positive, that means it's more than what it was to begin with. Could do that. 
I mean, just a thought, would it make sense to just get rid of the Z sensors all together and say that put four touch sensors on each foot? Yep. Well, yeah, then it doesn't lift all its legs up. So we could, we could <laughs> abandon Z altogether and go for touch, in which case it'll probably get a millimeter off the ground and then land again. I was thinking of maximize the duration of time. Maximize the duration of time in which all four touch sensors are zero. That Except the problem is, is that it might just lift its legs up and rest on its belly, depending on... What there you go. Doing. So you could put a touch <laughs> sensor in here, right? So there's lots of perverse instantiation pitfalls along the way. We're getting close. This is pretty close. We're almost there. Between the two ideas that were just put forth, yep. uh, if, it were, if we employ the touch sensors and say that touch sensors can't be on the ground, then we can do a... Um, I guess a two-dimensional fitness function maximization. And the multi-objective multi optimization. Yeah, we could have two objectives, one that minimizes or maximizes duration in which T's are all zero, mm -hmm. right? So make sure all your body parts are off the ground for as long as possible. Long. Objective one, while doing this. Okay, getting closer. I'll give you one more hint. Think about high jumping, the Olympic event high jumping, which is exactly that, right? What is the most important thing for a high jumper at the moment they're trying to go over the bar? You're maximizing the height of your jump. Wait, do you want to minimize the distance between Z1 and Z5 and Z3 and then maximize height afterwards? Getting closer. It's the most important thing for the high jumper. Well, it's usually flat when it's going over, so the average Z position for all its body parts. Yeah, which so this is kind of capturing. Right, yeah. As I go over the high bar, does it matter whether my arm is here or my arm is up here as I'm going over? What is the most important thing? Would it, could you take the average of the values of Z1 and Z5 and then take Z3 minus that? Z1 and, and Z5, why Z1 and Z5? <coughs> we're getting really close. Determine whether it's, it's uh, flat. flat or not. Yeah, yeah maybe. It's flat. What else is important about Z1 and Z5? There. What's that? They would have to leave the ground. They would have to leave the ground. Yeah. They're the ones that are closest to the ground, right? Just another going in different direction. Okay. What about average uh, velocity? So you can get that from position and time. Maybe. Average is EDT. Maybe. Yeah, maybe exactly. You could you could look for maximum forward acceleration or upward acceleration. When we started this discussion, jumping is easy, right? It's like locomotion, no problem. Come up with an easy fitness function for, for jumping. One last thing we're missing here. This is just sort of a, more of a shot in the dark. Okay. Going off of your um, high jumper example, maybe get maximizing the distance between um, our Z5 sensor and Z1 sensor while maximizing the height so that it spreads its legs out. But yeah, it spreads. OK, so well, let's stay with that. We're getting really close now. Z1 and Z5, you want them to be out, right? Why do you want them to be out? Because they're the you probably the lowest point. Yeah. And we want to try and get the lowest point upward. Mm -hmm. So minimize the difference between any of the five and not nice quite. They're really close. Like maximize the minimum. Th thank you. Mm -hmm. Maximize the minimum. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So at every point in time, remember this is going to take the maximum across T, right? Actually, let's work from the inside out, right? So at given times, at a given time step, we're going to look and see among the five Z's, which is the lowest Z, which at time step zero, these two are going to tie to be the lowest point, right? Assume that it actually does jump, then at some point later, one of these two might actually be the lowest point. We don't know which one. So at that point in time, let's imagine the lowest point is Z. So if you were to think about this over the thousand time steps of one controller evaluation, we're looking at the lowest point, and we're then looking to see what was the maximum of all those lowest points. That's really what jump matters, right? It's clearance. How high does the lowest point get from the ground. So after having taught this class six, six years in a row, this is the best we've been able to come up with. There may be something that's, that's better, but this will definitely get you jumping. Summing Z as a whole will, will not, right? 
Okay, so again, not all of you are working on jumping, but remember that thinking about thinking is misleading, right? All right, I'm gonna get my robot to jump. It's trivial to come up with a fitness function. I would suggest you do what we just did through pen and paper before you actually code things up. Write down a fitness function for grasping the object or throwing the object or having one robot and another robot collectively move an object. What is a fitness function that will select for what you want? Write it down and think about all the ways that evolution might outsmart you and come up with a perverse instantiation of your fitness function and refine it a couple times until you're happy with what you have. Stick it in, run it for a few minutes, see what you come up with, go back, add another term, modify a term, add a second objective. You might have to go to multi-objective optimization. This is actually another open problem in the field known as fitness function engineering. It's very, it's very, uh, labor intensive to formulate a fitness function that selects for what you want, in this case jumping, without explicitly telling the controller exactly how to do it. Not necessarily an easy thing to do. Okay, so we talked about wheels, we talked about fitness function engineering. Last thing I wanted to talk about was um, evolving morphology, which we will get to in lecture next week, but just uh, to get you started on that. Some of you are going to continue evolving the controller uh, of your robot, which is encoded in a genome, and that genome is a matrix called W, where every element in this matrix, WIJ, represents the synapse that connects neuron I to neuron J, right? Okay. So you might, if you're playing around with the morphology of your robot, you might add a second matrix to the genome called M, and M is going to contain all of the numbers that um, allow evolution to modify the robot's body. So, for example, um, we might take, again, our quadruped and allow evolution to evolve the length of the lower legs. And let's assume that all the lower legs, want to be, you want them all to be the same length. You don't want to have a quadruped with different uh, length legs. So M would be simply a matrix with one element in it, which is the length of all the four lower legs. Right? You then might decide, okay, actually I do want a quadruped that has four different lengths for the four <coughs> lower legs. So you modify M and now it contains four numbers, which are the lengths of the four lower legs. You might expand this to a vector with eight elements, which is the length of all eight legs and so on and so forth. So think about how you want to allow evolution to modify your robot's morphology, for those of you that are evolving morphology. Throw them all into this matrix, and now evolution is going to have to modify uh, these values, right? It's gonna to have to mutate values in both matrices. Easiest way to do that is when a mutation event occurs, flip a coin, Heads, evolution is going to mutate W. Tails, it's going to mutate M. And, and on and on you go. Make sense? Okay, and then obviously what goes into M is, is up to you. Okay, I think that's pretty good for now. We'll do some more on Tuesday. Any other questions about the final project? Okay, so back to lecture. We are going to finish uh, in a moment our discussion about swarm robotics. And remember, the overall goal that we're thinking about here is trying to evolve robots that can do something that's beyond the ability of any one robot. We were looking at our virtual lions and virtual gazelles last time, where any one lion is not going to be able to catch a gazelle because the lion doesn't move as fast as the gazelle, right? We may not want to create packs of hunting robots, but at least for uh, our purposes, this is a good task domain. And we'll move on shortly to lecture 24, the evolution of communication. Okay. Okay, so as we saw last time, uh, organisms do this very well. We can come up by hand with little simple rules where each element in the swarm is executing the same simple heuristics and get relatively sophisticated behavior. Remember that we're dealing with this infinite virtual Serengeti plane visualized by this two-dimensional plane, but it's actually a toroid. Remember, we're hand-coding the gazelle's behavior, but evolving the lion's behavior using genetic programming. And we then looked at nine different experiments last time. 
First experiment, we evolve the lions so that they uh, can see their connection to the gazelle. In the second experiment, we expand the perceptual abilities of the lions. Now they can see how they connect to the gazelle. They can also see their nearest neighboring lion. They can also see what lion is on their right, what's the position of that lion. And they can also see the lion on their left and see what is the position of that lion relative to ego, relative to self. That's called diectic sensing, things that are relative to me. You all are on my right, you all are on my left. Experiment number three, we looked at name-based sensing. So uh, a lion that's hunting in this pack can see, the, uh, can see a vector that connects self to lion one. So no matter where lion one is relative to me, I know where it is, and same for two, three, and four. So we looked at those three different kind of experimental variants, and then we looked at three ways of encoding behaviors in the lions. We can take one GP tree, which encodes a behavior, and implant or clone that same behavior in all four lions. So they all have exactly the same code, like the Boyds. Alternatively, we can create one tree that encodes four different behaviors for the four different lions. And in free breeding, we create a child tree here by inheriting or copying in code from different lions. So, for example, the behavior for lion 2 here is actually inherited from lion 1 in a parent. And restricted breeding is the behavior for lion 1 is always some mutated copy of a previous lion 1 strategy. And same for 2, 3, and 4. Three different perceptual abilities for the lions, three different ways of breeding teams for them. We're going to look at each pairwise combination, which gives us a total of nine experiments. For each of those nine experiments, we're going to do a hundred evolutionary runs and see on average among those nine experiments which pack of lions did better. And we looked and we're going to look at three additional runs, uh, three additional experiments, experiment 10, 11, and 12. How well does one lion do if we evolve behavior for it? A control case, which is how well does one randomly moving lion do? Last one, how well does four randomly moving lions do? And then here's all the details about each one evolutionary run. Okay, lots of build up. Here's the summary of results, and we're gonna walk through this a little bit at a time. Let's look at the three control experiments down here. In each experiment, you're gonna see they report the average fitness which is the distance of the closest lion to the gazelle. And among those 100 runs, which run produced the best hunting pack or individual uh, lion? So let's start with one random lion. This is pretty much the worst thing you can do. A randomly moving lion at the end of an evolutionary run in which there's no evolution, it's just random search. It's 7.87 units away from the from the gazelle, which makes sense, right? We're dealing with this 15 by 15 uh, grid, so imagine the lion's in the center, the gazelle is at one corner, right? The gazelle's pretty much done the best thing, keep as far from the lion as you could possibly, possibly get. Okay, as you can see, uh, one evolved lion over here doesn't do much better than a random lion. Why not? So an evolved lion has access to this information. It knows the direction that it went at the last time step. It can randomize its direction a little bit to try and throw off the gazelle, and it has information. It can see the gazelle relative to itself. Why does evolving one lion not do very well? Pretty much as good as just doing random movement. So there's only one lion in the simulation, or are there one evolved and four random? Uh, one, one random lion, so forget the four. On the plane, there's just one gazelle and one lion. Oh, because the gazelle is so much faster than the lion. Exactly, right? So even if we're evolving behavior for one lion, the best thing one lion can do more or less is head towards the gazelle. Maybe it moves a little bit randomly, but there's no obstacles on the plane. There's nothing else really for the lion to do. So... Clearly, we have a task here where we need some coordination among the lions. Okay. 
Uh, four lions obviously do better, and these are just random lions. These are lions that are moving randomly. But if they're moving randomly, they're going to probably spread out along this plane. So the gazelle is going to be closer to the lions than it would be to a single one, right? So we're going to evolve four lions in a moment. So this is kind of the control we're looking at here, right? So if evolution can do better than this number, that means that the lions are doing, they're coordinating somehow. Right? Okay. Let's have a look at clones over here. And remember clones here, this is all of the lions have exactly the same, uh, they have exactly the same strategy. Here, in this case here, none means the lions cannot sense the other lions. They can sense their own movement and the relative position of the gazelle. And even in this case, with limited perceptual abilities, they do better than average. So that tells us that even without explicit coordination, right, I can't see what my fellow lions are doing, I'm just focusing on what I do, even in that case, they can start to evolve a uh, strategy which somehow surrounds the gazelle uh, and moves in. So again, this is a wonderful paper, but unfortunately they did not actually describe any of the actual strategies um, that evolved. Would have been nice to see, but clearly the lions are doing pretty well. Yes. Oh, do you have a question? No. no. Okay. So that's none. And now let's compare for the clones. Again, this is all of the uh, lions acting um, together. They do, if we look at the best over here, with diectic sensing and name base sensing, the clones are doing better than no sensing at all or no sensing of their peers. So what does that tell you? If in the clone case, diectic sensing lions and name base sensing lions are doing better, and lions that cannot see their peers, what does that mean? Knowing where the other lions are is important. Knowing where, the other strategy. knowing where the other lions are is important, right? Makes sense. If I see you going, if I see you on my left, as fellow lion going up this way, and I see that you are to the right of the gazelle, then I might move to my right. Right? So there's coordination going on in these experiments here. Right? The lions are coordinating their behavior, not just based on what they're doing and what the gazelles are doing, but also based on what the other lions are doing. You'll notice that in the clone case, though, um, the name-based sensing lions are doing worse than the diectic sensing lions. Why might that be the case? all doing the same thing. It doesn't really matter which lion is over there. It just matters that a lion is over there. That's right. Exactly. So in, na in the name-based sensing case, remember here we have, in the name-based sensing, I can refer to, or I can sense lion one and lion two. If I'm lion three, lion one may be over there. And if I'm lion two, lion one might be on my other side, right? So we all have the same strategy which means we all may be looking at lion one, but lion one is different in a different position relative to the other three lions, <coughs> particularly lion one, if I am lion one. Okay, so you would think that name-based strategy is a little bit more sophisticated, but when we're all doing the same thing, that actually works against us. I was just, couldn't remember what the diectic. Diectic is were. relative to me. What the parameters were. Oh, the parameters are, right. Left, right, left, the, right, the lion that is the first one I see when I sweep in from in front of me towards my right, mm -hmm. that's the right-hand lion, and left lion is the direction that I'm heading. I sweep counterclockwise. First lion I see is the lion on my left. There may be other lions on my left. It's the one that is closest right. to the direction I'm heading in. Were there two others or not? Nope. No, it is only, okay. Pl plus the additional sensors, which is my connection to the, the gazelle and the direction in which I'm heading. That information as well. Do the name-based ones also have direction to gazelle and direction of heading? Do the name-based, the name-based ones are, is a vector from me as one of the lions to lion one. That's the vector that comes back to me. That's what I sense. So when I say the lions sense something, they're always sensing a vector. 
right? And that vector goes into their strategy, propagates up through the tree, and the vector that arrives at the root of the tree is the direction I'm going to head in at the next time step. Can you go back one, just one slide to the diagram? Yep. OK, yeah, so there were a couple more. Oh, I'm sorry, right. It, there the were vector the nearest from the, to the gazelle right. and the vector from the yeah. vector. OK. Okay, let's go to restricted breeding. We'll, we'll skip over free breeding, and you can see these did pretty poorly. Why did the free breeding runs do pretty poorly? Just as a reminder, here's how we breed teams in the free breeding case. Losing genetic information when you're switching who they are. Exactly, right? So Lion 2 in this parent, for example, might have been offense, and lion one might have been defense. And I'm just using those as short, shorthand for different sort of strategies, right? So if L2 is offense, and it gets copied into L1, and another copy comes in, remember when we talked about the com competing conventions problem with neural networks? You could end up with a child that has two defense players and no offense players, right? So we might have differentiation of strategy among these teams, but if we're <coughs> free breeding and we're copying different strategies for different lions into the child tree, we're mixing up strategies, right? So that doesn't, doesn't work very well, as you would kind of expect. The overall winning, uh, overall winning experiment here in all 12 experiments was restricted breeding and name-based sensing. Why? Because if, if each lion has a different strategy, it's then important to know where the lion is that's doing a particular thing relative to you. If each lion has its own strategy, right? So the fact that name-based sensing lions, in the case of the restricted breeding case, is working is because they do have their evolving specialized roles, right? So you not only have the evolution of coordination here, Coordination could mean, all right, we're going to coordinate. Every single lion is going to do something based on what's on its left and its right. That's coordination. But division of labor or specialization is a much more specialized form of coordination, right? Okay, lion one on a team is always going to be on offense, and the rest of the lions know that, and they perform their role correspondingly. So that's true. Obviously, you need to know which member of your team is on offense. It's lion one. Right? So this is evidence that without explicitly selecting for it, the, the fitness function only said, get towards the gazelle. Division of labor has started to <coughs> evolve in this team. Not unlike what happened several times in nature, where you had certain species where individuals started to coordinate their behavior and evolved division of labor, right? You tend to see that in the social insects and somewhat in humans. Question? Yeah, in the diagnostic sensing, couldn't it just be worse because there's a, there's a case when it only sees two lines? It's just not. Uh, it doesn't see as much, possibly. That's, yeah. a, good, that's a good point. It might near, not just the be that. The right could be the same. Left, that's right. true. That's true. It might be. So it would be interesting to go and look at, for example, this tree, the best strategy evolved, and is there a reference to all four lions in that that tree? Question. Um, well, I'm just kind of seeing that would eventually the same lion be fine with the gazelle. I don't know. They didn't report that in the paper. Again, that would be a really good thing to know, right? That would be further evidence that it's specialization, not just the fact that these lions can see more. What's they that? that? They do that in nature, like the pack eaters are supposed to be. The Absolutely, lions. right? You see that in in hunting uh, uh, hunting predators as well that coordinate. There is a specialist, right? They have their they have their roles. So, just to clarify, so when yes. they, when they start this, their the four the position of the four lions is randomized every time. Correct. That's right. So, um, I guess if you should throw, sort of try to transfer that more to reality, then yep. You know, if you're, you know, chase the lion chasing the gazelle, you might not see each other because it's called racism. Absolutely. Absolutely. Did they do any trials where they 
ran the simulation with the lines starting in the same position every time? I don't. Them? They didn't say that in the paper. They say they randomized the position. So would that would you have got more specialization if they all started in the same position, right? Yeah, they maybe they like start off with them knowing, you know, train them to see when they see each other, and then so they learn their be each other's behaviors, and then they blind them. Exactly. Do they know what the others are doing? So what would happen if, again, this is random placement, if the offensive individual, and again, not that offense is an actual strategy that evolved, but what if the, one, the lion that's usually an offense happens to be the furthest from the gazelle in the initial conditions? It would be useful for the lions to say, to know that, first of all, and for the one at the back to say, I'm too far away. I'm not going to play offense this round. Someone else should, right? You also mentioned there's no tall grass here, right? They can't necessarily see each other, so that's no good. If you have a group of individuals that needs to coordinate, but they can't see each other, what do they do? Yeah, but wouldn't the algorithm account for that? Because the other three could be in a position around the gazelle such that the gazelle had to be closer to the farthest. Possibly, so they could say, I see that lion one who usually plays offense is too far from the gazelle. I can see that, so I will, and I'm close to the gazelle, so I will assume offense. And I know that the other lions have evolved the ability to reason accordingly, so that's fine. But I don't know that they know, I don't know that they know that. It would be good if I could say, I could put up my hand, my paw, and say, I'm playing offense this round, right? Okay, so in all three of these cases we've just talked about, the offensive player is too far from the gazelle. There's tall grasses, you can't necessarily see each other. There's a need to switch roles, right? These are three of many, many problems that arise in a group of individuals, animals or machines, that are trying to coordinate their action, and there is one master solution that solves all of these problems, what is it? Omniscience. Omniscience would be nice. <laughs> Mother Nature hasn't discovered that particular strategy yet. Short of omniscience. It's not, that we know of. not that we know of. So we're not the omniscient one then if we don't know. In all those three cases, you can't you're playing a capture the flag with your friends and you can't see them in the woods, what do you do? Communication. Communication, right? So the lions here cannot communicate. They can communicate in, uh, in a limited sense. They can signal, right? So it's possible that lion one moves in a particular way that is sensed by the other lions and that particular motion signals to the other lions what lion, lion one's intent is. It's possible here, but that doesn't work when there's tall grasses, right? So my movements, if you can't see me, that doesn't do much. So it would be better if I was able to send out a signal in the environment that you can sense over long distances with obstructions in the way, and we get vocal cords. But they can't. I guess once the, they're chasing the gazelle, the gazelle should know that they're chasing them. So otherwise, that's giving them away. Possibly, right. We're leaving the gazelle out now for a moment, right? We, perhaps the lions uh, meet the day before and have a little meaning about what they're going to do, right? Okay. So, earplugs in the gazelle. Yep. Well, they may signal, right? But they may send out a signal that the gazelle can't understand, right? But, okay. So I think you can see where I'm going with this, right? So if we want, if Mother Nature wants animals to coordinate in a large, at a large scale, signaling will only get you so far. You need, as, again, as far as we know, there is only one tool that will do the trick if you want to coordinate beyond a certain level of sophisticated sophistication, which is communication. I'm not talking about language yet. Language is something separate, communication. So that's going to take us now from our part one to our part two in our theme on coordination and collective robotics. Now we're going to look at robots that not only coordinate their action, but also communicate. As always, we're not going to build communication in. We're going to select for a certain behavior where in order to achieve that behavior, the agents or the robots evolve communication. Okay. 
Okay, this is the one and only experiment you're going to see in this course where the robots actually have a sex. So we have male robots and female robots. This again takes place on a very, very simple uh, environment. No physics engine here. This was a pretty old experiment uh, in the field right at the beginning of evolutionary robotics. We have a 200 by 200 toroidal grid. So in the previous experiment, uh, the position of a lion was represented in real uh, numbers. Here it's uh, integers. So we're going to have discrete movement. We've got a total of 40,000 squares. Again, it's toroidal, so take this grid and turn it into a donut. We're going to drop 800 females into positions on this grid and 800 males, and the males and females have different capabilities. Females are deaf and immobile, so they cannot hear, they cannot move, but they can signal. They can, they can send out a song, and we'll talk about the song in a moment. Males are blind and can hear, they cannot signal, so they're, they're dumb, they can't speak, but they are mobile. You can draw whatever uh, relation, co correlations between these and human males and females you want. We will leave that aside for today. Okay, males and females. Um, in this picture here, we see three females, and the large squares around the females is the radius of their song. So any male that is inside this radius is able to hear the female. The song does not go beyond uh, this square. And we can see that the males uh, can sit at different uh, angles so they can point up, right, down, or left. And they move one grid per time step. Okay. Each uh, of the 1,600 robots in this simulation is controlled by a neural network, but these neural networks are slightly different for the males and females. So let's start with the female uh, neural network uh, at the top. It has an input layer, a hidden layer. You'll see there's recurrent connections in the hidden layer. Remember that for later. There's an output layer here. The input uh, neurons and the output neurons are binary, so we're going to use an activation function that squashes these neurons to either 0 or 1. Okay. The input arriving to any given female is the position and orientation of the closest male in her visual range. So for this female here, she would receive as input the position of this male and its orientation, not this male and his uh, orientation. Okay, so as you can see here, um, this particular female at this point in time sees a male, and that male is detected to her southeast. So this is dialectic sensing, male relative to her position, and the male is facing east. So remember, the female see, so they see a male that gets propagated through a neural network. We're going to evolve the synaptic weights in a moment. And the binary values arriving at the output layer are her song. So however many output layers, uh, output neurons we have, that is converted into a binary string, and that's the song that is sent outward into her song radius. And both of these males would hear that song. How do they hear that song? Well, the input layer for the male network is the binary string itself. Remember, males cannot see, they can only hear. So they receive the song, that gets propagated through the male's neural network, and in the case of the male, the values arriving at the output layer are integers, as you see here. There are four uh, output neurons. At any time step for a given male, we look to see which is the maximum of those four numbers, and the maximum number dictates which of these four behaviors the male carries out. Make sense? Okay. Okay, so we have immobile females and we have mobile males. Um, in turn, they, there can be one and only one individual in any one, uh, any one element, except if a male happens to move into uh, a unit occupied by a female, they mate and they produce one male offspring and one female offspring. It's kind of cheating because they don't actually mate because the two networks are different. They basically produce randomly modified copies of themselves. The male produces a randomly modified male and the female produces a randomly modified female. 
Those two male and female children um, are placed, uh, are, pla are overwrite two other individuals. So in this case, this male and female mate, and they produce a male child that kills off the male sitting here and takes his slot, and the female child kills off that female and occupies her slot. And then the male and female parents are moved to random positions in the grid. How do they choose which ones get killed off? They choose at random. Okay, so this is, uh, aside from the gender issue here, this is also a strange evolutionary algorithm because there is a population, 800 males, 800 females. There are no generations here. There's no fitness function. There's no fitness function being measured, right? There's just movement, and when males and females co-occupy the same cell, they produce two offspring, and those two offspring kill off two other individuals at random. Well, it seems weird, because you could make a not as good you could make a not as good copy as the ones that were killed off. So perhaps this male was doing a better job than the male child that killed it off. That's, that's true. However, we do know that whatever the male child is that overwrote this male, it is a randomly modified copy of a male that found a female. Um, are the male and females that occupy the same uh, cell, uh, are they safe from being deleted by the... Yes, the children cannot kill the parents. So again, the parents found each other, so they have a slight advantage. They can't be overwritten. So there is a fitness function here. It's just kind of hidden, right? What is the fitness here? What is the fitness for males? Find females. What's the fitness function for the females? Attract a male. That's it. There is nothing else. I mean, like, there's no objective since, like, the population is over 800. That's true. It's always a constant, constant-sized population. Some version of like Conway's Game of Life, where you just run this and see who's left at the end. Close, like Conway's Game of Life for those that know it. But in Conway's Game of Life, there is no reproduction with mutation and and so on, right? So this is still an evolutionary simulation, just very different from any one you've seen so far. Just a just a clarification. Yes, there could be a situation in which one pair has made all the children. That's and true. They can't die. Uh, no, they can. So if this, if these two parents produce children, and those children are placed here, and then at the next time step, some other male and female find each other, and they produce children, they could overwrite those children that were just born at the net at the previous time step. One pair of parents yep. makes has made all the children. None of the children can kill. Uh, but the but the grandchildren. The grandchildren can. Oh, Thank you. That's that's it. Exactly. That's right. That's right. Okay, so what happens? Okay, so we're going to look at this in terms of tables here, and I'll talk you through how to, how to read these tables. Um, we have uh, females, and in the case of the female neural network, we're going to assume that there are only three output neurons, which means we have strings, uh, binary strings of length three, which means there are eight possible songs that can be issued by any female at any time in this grid. There is no more than that. Now, whether a female actually uh, emits that song, who knows? OK, so we're going to look for the moment at the males. And we're going to look at um, one evolutionary run. And remember, there is, no, there is no generations here, but there is time. So at each time step in the simulation, all the uh, males are all the male neural networks are updated once, and the males move, and all the female neural networks are updated, sorry, other way around. All the female networks are updated once, females emit their song, and all 800 male neural networks are updated once, and the males move. That's one time step. All 1,600 agents do their thing, Next time step, all 1,600 do their thing, and so on and so forth. During any one of those time steps, if a male and female find one another, there's this reproduction event. Okay, they start with completely random 
uh, female networks, completely random male networks. And as you would imagine, the females emit songs at random and the males move at random. Um, after 100 time steps of this simulation, this is what you see. So in all of the 800 males, um, they took the percentage of what those males did when they happened to move into a female territory and happened to hear a song. So for all those males, whenever they heard 000, and I forgot to say if they're outside the song radius of all females, if there's no females nearby, then the males just hear 000. Females can also issue the song 000, which sounds to the males like complete silence. Okay, so 25% of the males moved forward when they heard 000, 38 turned right when they heard that song, 9 turned left when they heard that song, 28 stood still. So if you look down each of these rows, and each row will sum to 100, the 100%, the males are still just moving randomly, right? A quarter of the time, they do one of the four things that they can possibly do. How well do you think these males did at finding females? <clears throat> there probably weren't a lot of reproduction events during these 100 time steps, right? <clears throat> After 5,000 time steps, it now looks like this. Now what's happening? Obviously, males that stood still went extinct. Worst thing you can do if you're a male is not move, because you can be guaranteed there's no female where you were at the previous time step, and it's extremely unlikely that there will be a, male, a female there at the next time step. It's possible, right, if a female child gets teleported into that position, but extremely unlikely. So if you're a male, you're not that bright, what's the best thing you can do? Even if you should move forward no matter what you hear. You should move, yep. Yeah. Do the uh, triple zeros there included when they're outside of the radius of everyone? Yes. Okay. That's, uh, I, so those are males that either were outside the okay, song radius, good. but they could also be within the radius of a female that happens to emit the song 000 at that time step. Okay. Worst thing you can do is stand still. If you're somewhat bright of a male, simplest thing to do is go straight. Why go straight? If you go straight, you're going to continue on the same row or the same column of this infinite toroid, right? Why don't they turn left or right? Because eventually you'll just circle all the way around. You're yeah. circling all the way around, so the males actually have sort of a search strategy, right? They're looking for females that happen to exist on their row or their column. If you turn, you're not, you're still in the same square, right? Mm -hmm. If you turn, you're still in the same square. So if you turn left or turn right, you've burned one time step. You're guaranteed not to find a female during that time step. So don't waste time. Don't listen to any song. Don't turn left. Don't turn right. Don't stay still. Go straight. Again, lots of similarities between these males and some human males, but there you go. Don't listen to directions. Just go straight. just keep going around and they if they're lucky, there will be a female on their path. They might make it all the way around on their row or column, and during that circumnavigation, a new female has appeared somewhere on that row or column, if they're lucky. Is that a typo? Is the first line is 001? That is a typo, thank you. That should be zero, zero, zero. That's right. Okay, is that the best thing that the males can do? If the females are not emitting songs, or not emitting songs that mean anything, and again, we haven't talked about meaning yet. What does meaning actually mean? If the females are not emitting a song, maybe this is the best thing you could do, and this would be all that you see in these evolutionary simulations, but you can imagine from that lead-in that that's not what happens. So we're looking here in these tables at just what the males are doing, but the, the evolution of male behavior gives us a hint about the evolution of female behavior. Okay, so after 15,000 uh, 15, time steps, most of the time the males are going forward, but some of the males 
some of the time will turn right whenever they hear the song 101, and some of the males most of the time will turn left when they hear 110. Quick question, is turning left relative to their current position or is it left to be? Relative to their current position. So turning is relative, right? So they turn 90 degrees counterclockwise. Does the female emit a different song every time step or is it? It's up to her, okay. right? So remember her neural network is, she can see males in her territory and where they are in her territory relative to herself and the direction they're facing relative to herself. And then what song she emits under those conditions is under evolutionary control. If a female was in the first row, would the song correctly wrap around the far edge of the bottom side? Yeah, there, there is no first row, right? Remember that this is a continuous space. So there is always, uh, there's always a cell above you, below you, to your left and to your right. Gotcha. So with uh, song 110, if a female can see a male within her, I guess, sphere of influence, yep. she can immediately control which position she's going to be, it's going to be facing by constantly turning it left until it's facing her. She cannot control what the male does. Well, I mean, she can control what her song, does. Yeah. when she emits her song. And this is the big challenge about communication. So as we just talked about a few minutes earlier, mm -hmm. communication is the most powerful tool you can imagine for coordination, but it's tricky to evolve it because in communication, you need a mutation that produces a particular song, if you like, or a strategy of communication, and you need someone who hears that song or, or receives that communication and does the right thing. You need both of those things to happen. If only one happens, there's no advantage. Right? The female could be emitting a song trying to tell males, turn left, turn left, turn left, stop turning left, go forward, go forward, go forward. That could be what the females are trying to do, and they're not really trying to do anything. right? But if a female does emit that particular song and a male happens to respond in the right way, they produce one male and one female that are going to be slightly different from their parents, but more often than not, the female children will sing the same song as their mother, and the male children will respond to songs similarly to how their father did. Right? Okay, it's tricky, right? So you'll notice here we're at 15,000 time steps, so it's taken a while for this to happen. But through random chance and evolution, we now have the evolution of communication. Right? There are two songs now that females emit, um, and or there's two songs that they admit that males respond to. The rest of the time, males continue doing what males usually do, which is just... Okay. Okay, so what exactly happens here? Here's a visualization of it. We have the, uh, the female in the center here of her uh, signaling radius. Okay. And actually, uh, let's back up because we're getting ahead of ourselves. So the males evolve to turn when they're on the same row or column as the female. So the female is emitting one of these other six songs. A male has entered her territory. She doesn't switch her song. She waits and she waits and she waits until the male hits the same row or column that she is on, indicated by the shaded squares here. And the moment a male hits the same row or column, she switches her song, and some of these males respond to that by stop going straight and turning. Remember, the female can see that they're turning, and the minute that the male is facing her, she goes back to emitting one or more of these other songs, which the males respond to by just going forward and finding the female. Right? Okay, that's, what's that's what has happened at time step 15,000. If we keep going, the females evolve to become better singers in the sense that they know which songs the males will turn left and turn right to, and they expand the situations under which they will sing that song, right? So it might be, and it's not clear from the paper, that maybe one or two of these shaded squares would cause the female to switch to the left turn left or the turn right song. And her children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren might have also emitted the same songs, but now done it for more of these shaded squares. So in essence, the females are broadening the net in which they can capture receptive males. 
Same, same song, same communication strategy, just under more conditions. OK. Um, so they wanted to just, so they were starting to see the evolution of communication here, or the, evolution, the evolution of communication. They wanted to do a control case. So they went back, and they ran things from the beginning again. And now, in this case, they deafened the males. So the males can't hear the females at all. So this is like the control experiment we saw with the randomly moving lions. What's sort of the best thing a deaf male uh, can do? Which, as you can imagine, is to move straight. So deaf males will just go straight. It's the best thing they can do. And what that means is that we ev on average, every 100 moves, they find a female. So the more often you can find a female, which is the fewer number of moves until you find one, the better. So the lower the curve, the better. And these are, again, curves for males. So as you would expect, deaf males don't do very well. And males that evolve to listen to females and females that evolve to emit the right song do better. Strangely, at the beginning here, um, the deaf males actually do better than the males that are listening. Why? What's happening in that initial period? Because they're not hearing the song, they're more likely to just go straight. They're not hearing the, the song, and they're more likely to go straight, but the deaf males are always going straight. So that's not it. But the songs don't mean anything yet. The songs don't mean anything. They mean something in the sense that they may change the male's behavior. They may cause the male to turn right, but the female meant turn left, right? So the males are misinter they're, they're responding to the signal. They may be going straight, and they hear something, and they turn in the wrong direction, right? So they're actually at a disadvantage compared to the deaf males that are just going, going straight. OK, so that, if you think about it, sort of matches our, matches our interpretation here, right? So we have females that are trying to evolve a signaling strategy, but the males are not quite getting it. <clears throat> until about this point, and now just by random chance, we get some males that happened that happened to do the right thing under the right song conditions and start to evolve the ability to find females. Okay. Okay, so uh, here's a little cartoon. We have our female here emitting the song 000. A male appears to her southwest, moving to the north. It enters her territory, she switches her song, but it doesn't influence the male's behavior. Continues moving straight, gets here. The minute the male is on the same row as the female, she switches to song 011, which the male correctly interprets as turn right, turns to the right, and she go, goes back to singing the 101 song, which the male responds to by going forward. So this works well for males that can come in and can turn to the right. More sophisticated females can also capture males that are coming in from other quadrants. So here's the same strategy. Moving forward, 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 forward. She sings the 101 song, which causes males to turn to the left, which this male does. She sees that and continues singing the song because the male is above her on the same column, not on the same row. He turns left again, she keeps singing the song, and now she goes back to one of the move forward songs, and she's able to capture more males coming in from different directions. Okay, there's one last part to this experiment, but I think we will keep that uh, for Tuesday. You have a quiz due uh, tonight. Um, thanks very much.